Okay, welcome to this episode of the Athletic Fitness and Nutrition Podcast. My name is Paul Burgess, and today we are here with a pretty special guest, in my opinion. His name is Craig Pickering. Craig, how are you? Yeah, good, thanks. Yeah, how are you? Good, I'm very well. Um, and I'm not going to introduce Craig and tell you what he does. He's going to tell you all that. Um, so, mate, over to you. Tell us more about yourself. Yeah, thanks. So, um, I've had a bit of a sort of long history in professional sport. So, I used to be an athlete, used to be a 100-meter runner. And I went to four world championships and one Olympic Games in that. Um, and then I had back surgery in 2012, which meant that I missed the uh, London Olympics, which was obviously disappointing. And as a result of that, I was taken off lottery funding for athletics. So I had two options. I could find a real job, which I didn't really want to do, or I could find somebody to pay me to do another type of sport. Um, so sort of spoke to a few people and British Bob say were quite interested. They said, why don't you come have a go, see if you're any good. Um, I went to one of their testing days and I, I broke their, four of their push records. So they were quite keen for me to take a bit further. And then um, six weeks after that, I was competing at the World Championships in Bobsleigh, um, came 19th. And then a year later, I was picked at the Olympic Games, um, which was which was good. So maybe the eight, eight British athletes to be picked for both summer and winter games um but fortunately when i got to the winter olympics i then re-injured my back and had to retire um so that was the end of my sporting career and now i work for a company called dna fit and we do sort of genetic testing for well two streams of people professional sports um and also sort of your your weekend warrior or people that aim to sort of keep fit through a, through a daily training regime so they're the two aspects of people we work with and i try and help them achieve their goals so let's go back a little bit before we go on to your current stuff. Bob Slay, you, you decide to go from 100 metres in, in the sunshine and the summer sports to some sort of madness on a, on a piece of ice. And within six weeks, you're in the team and getting called up to do an Olympic Games. Yes, well, yes, yeah, six weeks was the, um, the World Championships. Uh, the World Champs, So right. in fairness... I probably wasn't quite good enough to be competing at that level, but the performance director made a decision to sort of accelerate my development by placing me into intense environments where I had to learn quite quickly. So they could have put me on the European Cup, which is kind of the second tier competition, and I would have learned, you know, would have learned the sport. But he decided to take me to the World Cup, so the sort of prime t- tier of competition. Um, so I did two World Cups, then went to the World Championships, um, and like I spent six weeks. Um, just learning everything. So I went from knowing nothing about Bob Slay to not being an expert, but knowing quite, you know, a good deal about it all. Um, and that actually, those six weeks were such a rapid development mental curve that I learned so much that I could take it then forward and consolidate over the summer period where I was just doing like preparation training for Olympics. Um, so that helped a lot. So I've been put in the situation where you're an absolute novice, um, but you have to compete at the highest level um, was, was really, really useful. Get you thrown in at a deep end. Yeah. Um, so, other than being fast off the, the initial sprint of that bobsleigh, were there any other skills that you transitioned over that you could use from your from your sprinting? Or was that really the main reason why that you were knocking seconds off of their, their top speeds? Yeah, so I was a brakeman. Um, so my job was essentially accelerate the sled from zero to as quick as I can make it go and then get in. And then I, my aim or goal was to stay still for about a minute as we go down the track. So I don't want to move whilst I'm in the bob say in case it throws it off or throws the balance off a little bit. So what I was good at, there's, there's kind of two types of sprinters. There's sprinters that can sort of powerhouses and produce a lot of force. That's me. And it's also kind of the older traditional sort of sprinters like Morris Green and for Christie, those kind of athletes. Um, and then there's also type of sprinters who are sort of more technical, technical based we call them sort of floaty sprinters. So they don't, they don't, they do produce force, but they don't produce it in the same way as, as the power athletes. They produce perhaps a bit less. They don't look quite as good. So sort of overall, um, they would be less good at bobsleigh because they can't produce the acceleration forces required, whereas power-based sprinters can. So I was an ideal pick because I'm reasonably stocky. I was good at 60 meters. Um, so I was good at the sort of the acceleration aspect of it all, um, which is why I was asked to, to give it a go. And so once you've got it going, you just jump in and let, let the rest of them do do what they've got to do. Yeah, but jumping in is the hardest bit. So you run in, like you go from running 100 metres on a straight track uh, to running sort of 
45 metres, 50 metres downhill on ice. Um, it's not a normal sort of running position either because you've got to hold on to um, the sled and that's it's not particularly high. So you're sort of in a crouched position running downhill. And in four-man, you've got to load in a sequential order. So you've got to, whilst pushing the sled, be aware of what everybody else in your team is doing, where they're loading, and then you've got to load in sequence. And, and was there any training for that? You know, if you're going to do that away from the actual event or the actual doing of the bobsleighing, yeah. so is there any gym training you're doing or anything like that, or do you just have to repetitively go over and over and over that? So we've got, um, well, British Bobsleigh have got one push track in the UK, so that's, that's at Bath, um, Bath University. So um, in the summer, I spent a lot of time there, probably was going there once a week from my base enough for it to, to practice. So I started off practicing on the single man push sled and then I progressed to doing it with two man and eventually progressed to the four man um, push sled so with four of the people so or three of the people so I could um, practice the skills in a sequential order um, outside of that then you just have to being a bob setter is essentially you have to be quite heavy so most high level bob setters are 100 kilos body weight um, and I, wow. when I finished athletics I was 85 so that's quite a bit of weight I got up to 96 the Olympics which was nice um so you spend a lot of time sort of building mass in the gym um being able to produce a lot of force because you've got to overcome the inertia of the sled when it's at, at rest and continue to produce that force um you do a lot of time focusing on, on your acceleration ability and there's a small bit of max velocity in that as well but there's no speed endurance and um, so that was the biggest change from athletics is all my running sessions became really short which is which was a nice change to have okay so let's move it on to then Currently, you're working for DNA Fit, who, if anyone knows me and, and knows this podcast, knows that I've got a lot of um, connection with and I do a lot of work with. But the reason I wanted Craig on today is because his his knowledge of genes and what they do and how they do it and so on is, is pretty phenomenal. So there's many a time where if I'm looking for some information, he's the first person I'll go to. So let's talk about DNA and why you think there's any valid reason for people to get it done because there's a lot of people out there at the moment that are basically saying well you know what we don't really believe in it that much we don't think the science is up to scratch yet maybe it's got some sort of value in the future but you know for now we think it's all a load of nonsense blah blah blah, blah. so from your perspective tell us more about why why it is what it is and, and what it does for us at the moment yeah you're right so wh when i'm dealing with individuals or sports teams the biggest bio to overcome is people have a preconception of what DNA testing is and what it entails, and that is usually talent selection. Um, and then they also sort of question the use of the DNA testing. So let's, if we start at the beginning, so let's say we take 1,000 people and we give these 1,000 people the exact same training program. We know some people will get a lot better, some people will get a little bit better, and some people won't get better at all. They'll, in fact, they might even get worse. So we know different people respond to a different extent to the same training program. And in professional sport, for example, if you're a non-responder to that training program, you then don't succeed in that sport. So the system as it exists right now fails the athletes that don't respond. So if we give you an example, let's say we take five sprinters and we give them the best sprint training program in the world, three of them will get quicker, two of them will get slower. And what, what the coaches would say is those two athletes were never going to be elite sprinters. Now, they may well have been elite sprinters, we just gave them the wrong training program that didn't enable them to respond. So the use for some people is that if they get their DNA tested, they can find what works best for them. It might be that they would have figured that out eventually, but it might have taken five or six years. And if you get a DNA test done at day zero, then you've knocked up, you've saved yourself six years of trial and error. It's the same when we do diet based stuff. We know that if you give thousand people the same diet some people lose weight some people get fatter and if you're the person that loses weight that diet's great but if you're the person that gets fatter then you've, you've you've wasted your time on that diet it's been ineffective for you so then you experiment and you change diet you try something else maybe that diet would work for you maybe it wouldn't if it did good if it didn't then you have to do another diet and another diet what we're doing on the diet side is knocking out again that try and error so you don't have to try different diets to find what works for you you've got a start point which is from a genetic standpoint, um, probably going to work reasonably well for you, and then you can make small changes within that. Now, the science is emerging, um, but there are 
good, there is good enough science now for us to make the recommendations that as a company we do make. And part of my day-to-day -day job is to find new genes or new research papers that add to our knowledge of the various things we report on so that we can give people even more information to know when to make good decisions. Okay, so someone comes to you, um, we get a swab done, get sent off to the lab, it comes up with a report, and that report covers quite a wide variety of aspects. Um, it does obviously the power and endurance ratio within that individual. What is that going to refer to? Is that going to refer to how many, what types of muscle fiber they potentially will have, or you know, what, what is that actually telling us? So the power endurance response tells us how well someone responds to that type of training. So do they respond better to power training? Do they respond better to endurance training? So it's not the case of saying, if you've got a high endurance response, you are an endurance athlete. It isn't that at all. It's how you respond to that. And we would say you should manipulate your training within the goals of your sport. So let's say you've got an Olympic 100 meter runner who comes out at 60% endurance, 40% power. That Olympic 100 meter runner is not going to train for his event by doing 5,000 meter repeats, even though he's got the high endurance capacity. Instead, he's going to do the endurance end of the spectrum of training within his event. So for him, that would be in the gym, reps of six to eight, as opposed to reps of one to three, which would be the power-based stuff. On the track, he might respond better to reps, sprint reps over 90 meters, 150 meters, 200 meters, as opposed to the specific power-based stuff, which would be 30 meters, 60 meters. And that, that is essentially my story there. So I am the Olympic sprinter who I had 6% endurance um, bias. And I found throughout my career that if I biased my training towards the endurance end of the spectrum of my sporting demands, I performed much better. Now, it took me eight years to figure that out. And it took a lot of trial and error and years of running not very well. Whereas if I'd have had that test at day zero, that could have helped. Now, in terms of specifics that we look at, we're looking at sort of 17 different genes um, each gene plays a different role. So one of the key genes we look at is ACTN3, um, which is probably the most studied um, gene with regards to sport performance. So what do you know about this gene? Well, this gene is called the sprint gene. We know it exists. The CC version exists much, much more in power athletes, elite power athletes, and the TT version exists much, much more in endurance athletes. So if we tested, um, well, in this study that tested elite level sprinters from the US and Jamaica, 97% of them had either the CC or the CT version, i.e. a version of the gene which works quite well. If we know that 18% of the normal population has the TT version, if we look at endurance athletes, about 30% of them have the TT version. So again, we know endurance athletes are more likely to have this than the general population. So that enables us to solve then make a guess saying that this gene is probably quite important. One version of the gene is quite important for power, one version of the gene is quite important for endurance. And then we start to create, or scientists start to create studies which test that. So then we give 100 people the same train, weight training program and then see if people with the CC genotype respond differently to people with the TT genotype, and they do. People that have got a CC version put on uh, much more they have much greater muscle hypertrophy than people with the TT version, whereas people with the TT version of this gene improve their muscular endurance much, much more than people with the CC version. So there's different ends there. We know what this gene does now. So it codes for a type of protein found in type 2 muscle fibers. So if you've got the TT version, um, you must much less efficient at creating this type of protein. Now, if you're an endurance runner or you want to be an endurance runner, that's good news because you don't want to carry around a lot of type 2 muscle fiber because it's next to useless in your event. If you're a sprinter, you want to be able to produce these muscle fibers because they enable you to produce force at high velocity, um, which is what happens in a sprint event. And then we know as well that the type of gene you have there is, is linked. It's not a cause of, but it's associated with levels of testosterone. So people have got the CC version and generally have higher testosterone. And that's because they respond better to, to weight training. And they also have greater activity of, of an enzyme called mTOR um, post-training. That's kind of that's part of the muscle signaling pathway for hypertrophy. So overall, we know that people that have got the CC version or CT version of this gene respond much better to a weight training program aimed at hypertrophy 
then people with the TT version. So it enables us to target our advice depending on the type of gene they have within that. So people that have got the TT version, for example, should focus on higher rep ranges, um, potentially repetitions to failure, whereas people with the CC version can do more um, power-based hypertrophy work. Okay, and that obviously applies to people who aren't professional sports people. They're just in the gym trying to find out how they can put some mass on or lose some weight and so on. So one of the questions I was going to ask you was when you – sorry, did you have your DNA – test done during your sprint training time and did you have that information when you moved to uh, bobsleigh or were you still just trying to find out what was going to be best for you when you made that transition no so i um had my dna test done once i've retired um as it went once when i sort of started to work for dna fit but over sort of 10 years 10 years of training at a high level you you start to realize what works for you and what doesn't work for you through experimentation so I started off with my second coach at university when I was running well. He was really coming from a background of in the gym, you're doing reps of six to eight. And on the track, you're doing sort of longer sprint work. And then when I changed coaches then to a different coach who was more about real specific sprint training, I actually didn't run very well, got a bit slower. Um, so he was doing sort of reps of one to three in the gym. Um, short, sharp sprints on the track, which is the type of training that most sprinters yeah. do, but that's because most sprinters have got a different genotype to me, so they, they respond they respond well to that, which is why it's a typical sprint training session, but I'd be so, kind of happy to be let down by that. So, okay, your original coach was using that um, default training program, which was more uh, obviously suited to you because you're, you, you've got a, a high endurance capacity, but was he doing that for everybody? Yeah. So, that was his blanket statement so yeah, for everyone. So that's usually how it happens. You get blanket training programs, and then coaches will make small changes within that. But most coaches have a training program that they have had success with, and so they are so they they're stuck with that training program because they know it works. But it works for athletes that they've worked with. But then if an athlete comes along that's different genetically, then has different needs that need to be met. And if that training program is not meeting those needs, the coach will generally think the athlete hasn't got the talent, whereas perhaps the athlete has got the talent but they're just not being able to express it through the training modality. So, so do you think we're going to be moving this more into um, the Olympic Federation and getting our, our athletes tested first so that they can get their training tailored to them? I know, obviously, Nick Jones does a lot of work with Olympic athletes. Um, yourself, uh, Andrew Steele does a lot of work with Olympic athletes. So are they going to start moving that down that road or are they still going to be throwing mud at a wall and see what sticks? I think within the next 10 years, most sports people will have their genetics tested. Um, in an ideal situation, you'd start to have sports teams testing their players when they sort of get to 16, 17, 18, so they can get a picture of the type of training which works for them throughout their career. Now, from an ethical standpoint, it's probably not a great idea to test people under 16 so they perhaps don't have the mental maturity to deal with the results and how you deliver those results is really important as well because it's, we're not testing for potential we're testing for the best type of training um, and part of our panel for example tests for injury risk and if you come up with a high injury risk it doesn't necessarily mean you'll get injured it just means you have to make changes or manipulate your environment to change the outcome but a lot of people would see that high injury risk and think that they're guaranteed to get injured um, so when I'm giving results to people I take you know Great, a great amount of time to explain the fact that this is not a diagnostic test, we're not saying any certainty, we're just saying this is what your gene state is half the picture, you need to be able to interpret this information and make changes based on that. But eventually, athletes themselves will, I think, at least be, be getting this done, and some federations will certainly buy into it more than others. Um, and once sort of the case study um, research is released, I think more and more people sort of start to realise that there is something in it and give it a go. Absolutely. So going back to general man in the street and the woman who comes to us and says, right, I want to get my genes done because I've tried every diet or I've tried putting on some size or I can't get rid of this last bit of fat around my belly. You know, this the usual sort of thing that people are actually looking for in the gym. How How is this going to enhance that for them how they're going to benefit from it and also what are they looking for 
in their results? So the key thing is that it just makes training really, really efficient. So if you're a professional athlete, you can train up to 10 times per week on double day sessions. Then if you have one or two training sessions which don't really meet your needs, that's not really a problem. Whereas if you're a man on the street who's only going to train two or three times a week and you've got a goal to lose 10 kilos, each session has to enable you to achieve that goal and your diet has to enable you to achieve that goal as well. So if you can do the training which will give you the most adaptation and best response from that, that's just an efficient way of training and it removes all the trial and error as well. So what will you get from it? Well, we can give you advice about what training works best for you, how often you can train or how quickly you can recover, um, how likely you are to get injured. So if your goal was to lose weight and you get injured and can't train for four weeks, that goal is taking a big hit. Whereas we can give you advice based upon what we see from a genetic standpoint about how to minimize the chance of that injury so you get more training out of it. On the diet side, then we give you the best type of diet for you to manage your weight or lose your weight. Um, and then we give you sort of advice about micronutrients and that kind of thing, um, and then a bit of food intolerances and food sensitivities. Um, so overall, you sort of are able to create a good diet, which will you know, enable you to be healthier and lose weight, and then have more efficient training off the back of that. So two quite important things. We also sort of see that people that are on a genetically matched diet seem to adhere to that diet much more. So that's an important aspect as well. I mean no point in having the perfect diet or what you perceive to be the perfect diet if you can't stick to it so if we're giving you the information to of what your raw materials are if you like what your genes are saying and we've seen that people that have that information and have a diet they know is matched for them and um, they stick to that diet um, much more so and the outcome is much more effective there's definitely a longer term compliance to that kind of stuff as opposed to just something that's come off the internet that as you say may or may not work for for whoever um, I think one thing that I do try and explain to the guys and the girls that I speak to is it's not a quick fix. It's not something that's going to say, right, yes, you're going to be, you know, six weeks, eight weeks time, you're going to have that bikini body or whatever else it is. It's something you've got to stick with long term. But what it will mean is it makes life a lot easier when it comes to managing your weight and um, training properly rather than trial and error, try this, try that. You know, going on to bodybuilding.com and just picking a, a, a workout routine that you like the look of, or you you think the guy that does it is a is famous enough for you to follow. So um, it is a long term thing, but it does make big big changes in people who who do follow it. Yeah, no, exactly. It is it's, it's not a quick fix at all. What it is is putting you on the right path to, or the more efficient path for you to be successful, and it explains some traits you may have realized about your career or, or your train history or it will enable you to make smaller finer tuning things it's not you buy a test and in eight weeks time we guarantee you'll lose 12 kilos you've still got to do the work around that it just provides you with more information from which you can to make all your decisions with. okay so what can you see happening in the future now so there'll be more and more genes added to, to panels as more research is done um the research will be Become more validated um, as a company were aimed to do that with some of our own studies which will get published um, very soon um, so once the validation and the number of, of genes is is increased more people will do it so more people will be aware of it more people will realize what the what a test entails so like I said at the start of the show most people think it's a talent identification test it isn't at all everyone can get the genes tested and everyone can get useful information from that um, the price is at a point now where it's cheap enough to do that if you've got that sort of little bit of extra income, as, a, as opposed to 10 years ago where it cost £10,000, it's significantly cheaper now. So, And that'll just continue forward, there'll be more information, more people will be aware of it, more sports teams and sports people will do it, um, to the point where, as I said earlier, most people, most sports people will have it done. Uh, and, that'll mm. fill, and as always, stuff that happens in professional sport will then filter down into the I guess the real world, the normal world where people um, take sort of aspects of work to professional sport and try and apply them to, to their sort of training as well. So then more people from the, the real world will start to have um, testing as well and then they'll see good results, pass that information on to their friends or family um, and then the whole thing will just explode a bit more. I think um, there will be a time in the not too distant future where most new 
members of a, of a gym or health club will, will get tested as part of their induction package potentially and so it will just save them I know in my experience probably 30 years of trial and error and trying to see what works and what doesn't I mean that's an, a really really big leap forward for someone in their training and diet because if you can know from day one when they, they walk into the gym at 18 20 years old and they can know from there that this is what you've got to do um, it makes such a difference because you see so many of these guys especially young guys coming into a gym all training together doing exactly the same thing and yet they're all different body shapes they're all different genetics and and some of them will still be there in five years time and the others would have dropped away because they're just not seeing results or they just not don't like that type of training whatever else it is i think it'll be um, a, a big leap forward once we can get the cost down and the speed at which they can get the results back um i think it'd be phenomenal yeah no, i think so as well and i think if, you, if you've got to remember that a lot of things happen in, in your life especially in your sort of initial five years of training that sort of lay the foundations for later on so if you get a major injury in your first five years of training then you're less likely to do that training or a training program later in the future you're going to be um limited in the exercises you can do whereas if you can give people information to reduce that injury which we do do as part of our test then long-term lifetime compliance and lifetime health and fitness is sort of a bit more likely to happen. Similarly, like, again, you put on a, you're able to put on most of your muscle in your 20s and early 30s, and then as your testosterone dips as you get older and, and the normal aging process, that's harder to do. So if we enable people to have the right training at the, in those first few years so they can maximise their muscle growth, then later in life, again, they'll be able to maintain that muscle mass a bit more because they'll have more of it. Um, so the health of the nation will improve a bit more because we know that muscle mass is linked to falls and that kind of thing um, in older people. So overall, it just enables people to have more information to make decisions based on their training. Um, and then long term, that improves their health and also compliance. OK, so that's kind of the top line stuff. You know, how do I lose weight? How do I do my training, etc.? The, the The report also gives us some really good information when it comes to detoxification, uh, methylation, that kind of thing. I'm particularly interested to hear your view on methylation, um, what it is, why it's important to know, um, and why it might be important to support using B vitamins if it, if you've got the gene that says you might not be um, naturally supporting it so well. Yeah, so we're looking at a gene here called the MTHFR gene. Um, so this gene codes for an enzyme which converts, it has a number of roles, but one of the main ones in relation to our report is it converts homocysteine to methionine. Um, and elevated homocysteine levels have been shown to be linked to cardiovascular disease. So if you've got the version of this gene which works well, then you, you're not really at an increased risk of high homocysteine because it, the conversion pathway works really well. If you've got the version which works not as well, you have like 35% of the enzyme activity. So you end up with a buildup of homocysteine. And that eventually will lead, or could well lead to um, increases in cardiovascular disease. So what do you need to do about that? Well, we know from the studies that if the folate um, intake through food or if supplementation, if that's the way you want to go for that, um, reduces everyone's homocysteine. Um, but for people that have got the, the weaker version or the less efficient version of this gene, they can get their homocysteine down to a very good level, as in a non-risk factor level, just by having um, a bit more than a recommended daily allowance. So it's at 600 nanograms a day, um, which is why we know that if the recommended daily allowance is 400, um, that will fail those people. They won't, be, they won't be getting sufficient folate from their, from their diet to reduce their risk factors, which is why genetic testing is quite important, because it enables you to manipulate the information that's already there. So, like I said, the recommended daily allowance will fail those people, um, whereas if they have a genetic test done and realise that they're at risk, they can increase um, their intake, not not much, just slightly above the recommended daily allowance, um, to reduce their overall risk factor for, for this kind of thing. When you couple that with the test they do for caffeine, and someone who's sensitive to caffeine, um, where studies have shown that if they have more than four cups of coffee a day, they, they could have a 70% higher risk of heart attack or, or cardiovascular disease. Those two together are quite powerful things, really. Because if you've got a 70% risk, 
if you're drinking more than four cups of coffee and you're under methylating, um, potentially you've, you've got a trip to the hospital coming on. Yeah, exactly. We just want to give people information that they can, they can use to, to make better decisions. Now, we're not saying that if you have the less efficient version of the NTHFR gene and you're at, you know, at increased risk of um, heart attack, if you have more caffeine, that, that definitely will happen. What we're saying is that from a statistic point of view, that's at, you're at an increased risk of that happening. And the, uh, there's this very, very good study on the, on the caffeine heart attacks which showed that essentially the more coffee or caffeine anybody intakes, the greater their risk of heart attack. And then they split that into the two different genotypes, so fast and slow metabolizers. And they found that the fast metabolizers, that risk just disappeared. It was essentially linear. The more caffeine they consumed, their risk of heart attack stayed more or less the same. It went up a little bit as they got ridiculously high. But then for slow metabolizers, it was, the risk was even greater. So for one cup of coffee a day, your risk was one. If you had two to three cups of coffee a day, it went up to almost two. And then if you had four or more, it went up to almost three times as much. So those people are, really are at risk. Um, and knowing that information is, again, just an energy to make decisions. Um, and I think once the sort of science catches up with that a bit more, we'll see that being used in professional sport more. So from an anecdotal standpoint, I'm a slow caffeine metabolizer. Uh, and I knew from experience that I could handle less total caffeine. I used to use caffeine before a race. Um, but 300 milligrams was my maximum sort of tolerable intake. Whereas some people, if they had 300 milligrams before a race, they just wouldn't feel it. Uh, they'd be mm. fast metabolizers. And if I had caffeine, um, pre-race, let's say I was racing at 8 o'clock at night, which is the time that sort of most Grand Prix are on, it wouldn't be uncommon for me to not get to sleep till 4 or 5 a.m. because um, I was a slow metabolizer, I just couldn't get the caffeine out of my system and it would keep me awake for long periods of time. So there are some studies going on over in Canada on caffeine genotypes, so fast slow um, metabolizers and sports people. Um, so eventually I think that will become more and more useful and sort of when I when I'm doing consultations with people and talking through their report and I tell them this little bit of story about me, they generally agree fast metabolizers usually can handle more total caffeine and it doesn't disturb their sleep, whereas slow metabolizers can usually handle um, less total caffeine and it does affect their sleep. And then eventually as well, I think we'll find that fast metabolizers, when they're doing their caffeine strategy pre-race or pre-workout, they'll find they can have caffeine much closer to, the, to their training session um, where stone metabolizers will need it further away to, to avoid any adverse effects. From a um, general population point of view, who go to the gym, train, go home, all the rest of it, have a couple of, cu a couple of cups of coffee during the day, maybe a cup of tea, green tea as well, because that's got caffeine in it. Um, my, my concern to some of it is that if they take a pre-workout formula, that you can buy now for you know, 19, 20 pounds off a shelf, whatever else it is, they tend to be really heavily stacked with caffeine. I mean, I saw one the other day with 500 milligrams per dose, which is huge. And if you're uh, some, someone who's sensitive to it and your upper limit for the day is 200 milligrams, then you're already taking twice what you should be taking. So people aren't really aware that the, the dosages are quite small, really, when it comes to what they should and shouldn't be having. Um, and again, I've had a lot of people that I've done tests for that have come out are sensitive to it and have really had to be very conscientious about what they do and what they eat or, or what they drink because they didn't realise they're taking in like six, seven hundred milligrams a day and then wondering why they can't sleep. Yeah, no, I think most people are unaware of how much caffeine is in certain things and the effects that can have on you. So. Most people know something's not quite right with their sleep or how they're responding to certain things, but they don't know what it is, which is, again, is, is kind of the good thing or the power of our, our test that we do is it, sort of, it just gives more information and you go, oh, yeah, yeah, that does make sense. I'm not sleeping very well at night and that's because I'm having um, coffee with my dinner and uh, now I know that I can make that change, that one change, um, which isn't that hard to do. Just don't have coffee when you have dinner and then you'll sleep much better and your overall health is much better as well. Yeah. Okay, so if people want to find out more about you and what you're doing and, and DNA Fit and so on, um, first of all, for you, because I know you post a lot on Twitter and some really interesting studies and so on that you put up, 
Where can they find you? What's the best place to go? Yeah, the best place um, is Twitter. So it's at Craig 100M, so 100 metres. Um, that's probably the place where I centralise most of my stuff. So if I've written an article somewhere, I'll post it on there. Um, if I've come across something interesting, I'll retweet it. So that is the the first port of call. Um, people are interested in, in me. Um, and then if you're interested in DNA Fit, you can find them on on Twitter as well. So that's at DNA Fit HQ. Um, or they can use the website, which is www.dnafit.com, um, and they'll find stuff on there. Brilliant. Okay, mate. Right, well, thank you so much for spending some time with us today. Really appreciate it. I know you're a busy lad. That's no problem. Um, are, you, um, are you down in London next week? No, no, I'm not. I, uh, okay. I, I've got something else on, so I can't, I can't quite make that one, unfortunately. All right. Well, I'm going to be there, so we're going to miss each other, but um, I'm no doubt we will catch up soon. Thanks very much again, mate, and um, all the best for... What comes up over the next few years? I'm really interested to see what you guys are going to put together. All right, thanks a lot. Thank you. Until then, we speak soon. Cheers, bye. Bye, mate. Cheers, mate. Bye.